Let's start. So welcome everyone to the defense of uh, Igor Zakharov. Uh, the supervisor is Dr. Viktor Limpitsky and the doctoral program is <coughs> Computational Data Science and Engineering. Как мне переключать эту штуку? Или... А? Окей, тогда next слайд. Окей, so let me first briefly introduce uh, the jury. So my name is Ivan Siledets. I am the di director of the Center for Artificial Intelligence Technology here in Skoltech. Well, and I work in machine learning and artificial intelligence in many different directions. Next slide. Uh, so the next jury member is uh, Professor Dmitry Dilov. Uh, he's, uh, he's an associate professor of, at Skoltech as well, and he is the head of computational imaging laboratory. So he earned his PhD in electrical engineering in Princeton in 2010. And before joining Skoltech, he has been working in General Electric uh, Global Research as a lead scientist, and he has established quite a lot of uh, interesting new theoretical and computational parad paradigms in imaging systems. Next slide, please. Uh, so the next jury member is, is also from Skoltech, uh, Professor Gonzalo Ferrer, who is the head of Mobile Robotics Laboratory. And he completed his PhD thesis in 2015 on robot navigation at the Institute de Robotica Informatica Industrial Aire in Barcelona, Spain. Uh, so he also got several awards. But and before joining Skoltech, he worked during two years as a research fellow at the April Lab. So he works at Skoltech already for uh, already for five more than five years. Next jury member. So now we move to our international uh, jury members. Uh, so we have Associate Professor Tanjin Chan. Uh, who is an associate professor at the School of Computer Science and Engineering, Nanyang Te uh, Technological University. So he received his PhD in 1996 from the University of Cambridge. Uh, he was then at uh, Jesus College Research Fellowship in Science 1996-97, and from 98 to 2001, he was a research scientist and DEC, Compact Research Lab in Cambridge, USA. And after joining Nanyang Technological University, he was concurrently a faculty fellow in the Singapore MIT Alliance Computer Science Program 2003-2006. And his research interests are broadly computer vision and, uh, and machine learning. Next. Please. So the next jury member is Dr. Jai Golchoi, who is an associate professor at Kim Jiu Shul Graduate School of Artificial Intelligence and KAIST. And <coughs> he has been previously an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at Korea University from 2015 to 2019, and then associate professor in the Department of Artificial Intelligence at Korea University in 2000, uh, 2019. So he received uh, his master, uh, master's and PhD from Georgia Tech, so master's from School of Electrical and Computer Engineering and PhD in School of Computational Science and Engineering in 2013. Uh, next. Uh, the next jury member is Dr. Hao Li. He is a CEO of Pinscreen, which is a Los Angeles-based startup that builds AI-driven virtual avatars. And he, as well, he is an associate professor of com computer vision at the Mohammed bin Zayed University of Artificial Intelligence, OIE. He obtained his PhD from ETH Zurich and master's degree in the computer science from the University of Karlsruhe in Germany. He also was a distinguished fellow at the University of California, Berkeley, an associate professor at, com at Computer Science D Department at the University of South Carolina, and the director of Vision and Graphics Lab at USC Institute for Creative Technology. So his work, uh, he, he works on depth sensor-driven facial animation, uh, has also led to the Animoji feature on the Apple iPhone X, which is extremely cool. And he also got 
several awards, including uh, Naval Research Young Investigate Award, Google Faculty Research Award, Takava Foundation Research Grant, and, Andrew and Ernie Witterbe Early Career Cheer in 2015. Next. Uh, so the supervisor is Dr. Viktor Limpitsky, and his prior affiliations include VR Project at Yandex, uh, and he was also an associate professor at Skoltech, lab leader, and then the head of Samsung AI Center, and he also held research positions at Oxford Micro uh, University and Microsoft Research Cambridge. He has PhD from Moscow State University, and his research interests include learning-based approaches for vision, graphics, and virtual reality. He was also awarded a Scopus Award in 2018. Next. Uh, and finally, in my introductory speech, uh, I have to introduce uh, Igor Zakharov, not, not yet a doctor, but he is already a lead research scientist at Samsung AI Center. So he received his bachelor degree from Moscow State University, master of science degree from Skolko Institute of Science and Technology. Uh, and from 2018, he joined Samsung AI Center as a part of an industrial PhD program at Skoltech. And his research interests include generative modeling, neural rendering, 3D reconstruction. We will hear about it today in his presentation with publications at CVPR, ECCV, and ICCV. And uh, I have to mention that his work on neural head avatars has received international media coverage and has been marked as the most scientific, discussed scientific publication in the media of 2019. Yeah, that's all. So now we will have uh, the presentation by the candidate, by Igor, so approximately 40 minutes. Mm, and then I will tell everyone what to do, so we will have questions from the jury. Okay, Igor, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Ivan, for the introduction. Um, can you see my screen well? Yes. All right. So the topic of my thesis is synthesis of human face and body images via generative adversarial networks. And before I begin to talk about the methods that we proposed, I'd like to explain why do we really need to synthesize realistic humans. And the most obvious answer is that special effects and movie industry spends millions of dollars, even tens of millions of dollars, to create realistic and possible CGI reenactments of real world actors. And automating this process, making this process simple, because right now it costs so much because it requires a lot of manual labor. So automating it would make a huge impact in that industry, not only for the big players such as Hollywood, but also small scale, um, small budget documentary productions um, and so on. And another application that truly fascinates me is its potential to transform the way we, uh, well, uh, to transform the teleconferencing industry because right now what we use for teleconferencing is basically video chat uh, with 2D uh, video projections. But what we could use, we could use AR and VR devices to truly converse in a lifelike 3D experience. But for that, you need to create and realistically render depictions of humans, ergo avatars. And the topic, so this, the topic of human image synthesis have been studied extensively in both computer vision and graphics. And I mentioned two of the most well-known classical graphics systems. So on the left, it is a light stage scanner, which is a structured light scanner that extracts a um, high fidelity appearance and 3D reconstruction of a subject by projecting a set of predetermined light patterns. And while the results, even in 2000, year 2000, were already quite good for the reconstruction and the renders, uh, this uh, setup is quite bulky and nowadays can cost millions of dollars to build. So it's not really scalable for day-to-day uh, -day use and restrictively expensive for the majority of the applications. But already at that time, in concurrent works, they tried to use this uh, statistical, uh, th this mesh models, these scanned meshes, and reduce their dimensionality uh, so that they could be estimated from even a single image. And that's the statistical mesh models or the so-called parametric models, where, which basically use around a few dozen parameters to estimate both facial shape 
and facial appearance. And while the realistic static renders could already be achieved from a single image in the year uh, before the year 2000, it took a few decades. Uh, it took more than a decade to nail uh, the dynamic video synthesis because we as humans are more sensitive to the dynamic content of the of the human centric imagery rather than the static one. And these are the two representative systems that more or less nailed the uh, facial swap, the so-called, and managed to make it look realistic and almost indistinguishable from reality. Uh, they relied on parametric mesh models to extract the shape and trained, learned the appearance via an optimization-based process. However, they required hours of training and uh, a lot of per-subject training data in order to obtain these models. And in order to make them more applicable, one would, would want to have a method that would generate such an avatar given just a single image and being, still being able to animate it given various expressions. And for that, you really need some priors that would encapsulate all the variety of human appearance and motion. And one good candidate for such priors at the time were generative adversarial networks that shown, have shown rapid advancements in generative modeling as shown on this slide. And while these results were truly impressive, uh, with the rightmost image being almost indistinguishable from reality, they offered little control over what pose, identity, and expression is obtained via synthesis, because all these images are produced from a latent noise vector, and this noise vector contains both appearance and expression in an entangled form. And in order to approach the controllable image synthesis, we need to actually disentangle uh, the appearance and motion into separate latent representations, which are then fused by the generator to predict the output. Um, here I show the image-based inputs, but driving image can be also audio or other type of modality. So for the training, so how do we actually train this, these entangled methods? What are the potential training procedures? So what we could do, we could take a video of a person, sample two random frames, use one frame as a source, another frame as a driver, and try to impose the motion of the driver onto the source, using driver as a ground truth. However, this, this approach has a, one major like da da dangerous thing that could happen. The network could completely ignore the source image and produce a degenerate solution where it basically auto-encodes the driver. The same could happen when we use different identities. So we sample just two random images for training and trying to impose the driving uh, motion onto the source. So if we use, uh, so this case is already unpaired, so it's harder to supervise because there is no pixel alignment between these images. But also if we use source image for supervision, for example, and ask the output to have the same identity as the source, the network would start to ignore the driver altogether. So the task of training these avatars can be quite tricky, and that's why I dedicated my PhD thesis to solving it. Um, not solving, but at least addressing and creating some of the methods to solve it. Um, and one of the works that I'm going to talk about is image manipulation uh, with perceptual discriminators in which we represented appearance and uh, motion as basically binary vectors. So we trained specific systems that would, uh, specific networks that would be generalizable to different appearances, but that would specialize only on one thing. For example, drawing a smiling smile on a person without a smile, or changing the hair color, or changing the gender, and so on. So this work was done with my colleagues, Diana, Dima, and Victor. And the idea here was to use GAN-based training uh, but the catch was that when we applied standard GAN-based training techniques at the time, uh, they were overfitting for our data set. So we could not produce uh, realistic results using the standard techniques. And so we decided to modify them and make them more robust. And for that, we decided to address specifically the architecture of the discriminator in the GAN-based training. So a regular discriminator operates at the level of RGB images. So it accepts RGB images and tries to distinguish which one is real or fake. In our case, we wanted to regularize it by using a pre-trained network, uh, which is similar to perceptual losses, uh, where a pre-trained network pre-trained on ImageNet um, is used on the images to produce a set of feature maps, which are then used 
to compare the images in the case of perceptual losses. And in our case, they were used to distinguish which image is real or fake. So this uh, network operated at the level of feature maps, providing it additional degree of regularization. And here are the results that we were able to achieve. So our method not only produced less artifacts than the uh, baselines that we, we compared against, but also provided more realistic uh, edits. And while the approach that we developed actually worked decently well for the images, um, we did not use this perceptual gun in our follow-up works because in this work, as I said before, we used a pure gun-based training um, and we actually used unpaired translation as a training modality. So we gathered a data set of, well, let's say, uh, women and uh, men and tried to match map the uh, mapping between the two or the data set of people who are smiling and not smiling and find the mapping in an unsupervised fashion. But for the avatars, it was shown that a more powerful training formulation can be found. And it was proposed in multiple concurrent works, which all used supervised training with paired data. And the approach is basically explained on this figure, everybody dance now, where we shoot an image, a video of a particular person, for example, dancing, making the movements and so on. And, and then we, I'm sorry, and then we extract the key points or any other pose representation, such as dance key points, uh, frame by frame from this image and just try to invert this extraction process via a generative network. So our generator accepts this pose representation and tries to predict uh, an RGB image from it. And since this pose representation gives a little in terms of like content cues, so what kind of person there is, what kind of clothing uh, they are wearing, uh, what kind of hairstyle they have, this generator has to generalize to new poses. And then you can actually drive this avatar using um, different people with different proportions. However, since this system operates in a purely generative fashion, so it just predicts the RGB image given this pose input. It generalizes poorly to novel views or novel poses. So as you can see, the result here looks much worse than the ones described on the previous slide because we specifically rendered this uh, pose sequence to highlight changes in the camera and changes in the pose and see that it lacks generalization. However, this is not the problem for classical rendering systems which use textured meshes because for the textured meshes, uh, there is no problem of view consistency. You can easily render view consistent, uh, provide view consistent renders. But the classical methods lack in realism. So what we wanted to do in our textured neural avatars work that was done as part of a big collaboration um, is to find something, a system that would be in between the classical and neural rendering. And what we came up with was, uh, again, an image-to-image -image translation network generator that would map input pose, but instead of directly predicting the RGB image, it would predict part coordinates and part assignments, which would have an associated learnable texture stack with them. So if we forget about this generator part, the texture stack and the part coordinates are basically texture coordinates that are then rendered using a standard rendering process to produce an RGB image. But instead of predicting these part coordinates from a 3D model, we predict them directly using the generator. And to supervise and initialize this network with some uh, semantically coherent parts, we use a pre-training by a dense pose system. But we then switch off this uh, auxiliary loss and only fine tune using photometric uh, losses. And here is the results that we achieve. So this is a novel view and a novel post track. And you can see that our result is already much more coherent in terms of both temporal consistency and realism and lacks most of the artifacts present in the competing methods, such as this bit to bit output. You can see that it generalizes really poorly for some of the uh, cameras and even sometimes the face uh, is the head becomes transparent for some reason, which is not happening in our case. But while this uh, system is, uh, while this approach is capable of learning these avatars given a sparse video capture or a monocular capture, we wanted to explore possibility of creating avatars given just a small collection of images 
or even preferably a single image. And we explored it in this work, uh, which was done with my colleagues, Sasha, Igor, and Victor. And in this work, we proposed this method capable of creating head avatars, well, because heads are much less uh, complicated and sophisticated in terms of degrees of freedom than human bodies. Um, uh, and so these were the results that we're able to achieve uh, by driving this input image with a pose track. And the idea that we use is quite similar to other image to image approaches. So we're still trying to invert the key points. We're still trying to texture the key points with, uh, to produce an output image of an avatar. But instead of making this generator specialized to synthesize one particular avatar, we introduce a number of adaptive parameters into this generator that are predicted from a set of training images of that person. So basically we condition the generator uh, using a specific task, a specific person that it needs to reenact. And then we use a standard GAN-based training where the ground truth is the same image that is used to estimate these key points. And the results at the time um, were quite good because we were able to generalize to old photographs, for example, like this photo of Dostoevsky, or even the paintings like this Mona Lisa. So thanks to the fact that we, we have been using a lot of training videos, we were able to capture the essence of what the human appearance is and generalize to even out of the main cases like this Mona Lisa. However, these results did not look really realistic, both in terms of quality and in terms of identity preservation, because we still use these key points in order to drive the avatar. And we found out that the shape of the key points is imprinted onto the appearance of the avatar. And as a result, by driving Mona Lisa with three different people, we get three completely different reenactments. So while this problem is quite serious and we're going to address it in one of the follow-up works, for now, we were happy with the key point based driving because what we wanted to try to do, we tried, we wanted to try to, well, make this um, reenactment systems run on uh, for mobile video conferencing apps. And so we wanted to, we were happy with self reenactment because in mobile video conferencing, you would use um, your face to drive your avatar. But we wanted to, at the same time to compress the models and make them run faster. So our concurrent and follow-up works that appeared the same year after our neural token heads achieved impressive advancements in terms of image quality. However, they both are too heavy to run on Android devices. Um, they would probably run quite fast on iPhones, probably not real time, but fast. But on Android, since its toolkit is much less sophisticated than the one that Apple has, we had to really come up with a new model that would be uh, truly lightweight, like a mobile net compared to a ResNet. And so we tried to develop this mobile net of the human avatars uh, and with my colleagues, Losha, Sasha, and Victor. And our main insight was that all the avatar systems uh, can be roughly separated into two parts, initialization module, which is run once per avatar, and inference module, which is run once per frame. And we noticed that all these methods, so first order motion model and uh, the video system that I shown on the previous slides, um, have a negligible initialization cost while offsetting most of the computation to infer each frame. And we realized that, well, that's not ideal if we want to make the inference as fast as possible. And we wanted to offset as much computation as possible into initialization while making inference lightweight. And so this is the approach that we came up with. It resembles the neural talking head systems in a way that we still have an embedding network that produces um, appearance embeddings given an input source image. But now the generator is split into two parts. So the first part is the lightweight part inference generator that uh, is conditioned additionally on the pose that we need to reenact for the particular frame. And it predicts the low frequency component, which is basically the best approximation for the output image that this inference generator can predict. But in order to introduce high frequencies, since this image is of relatively poor quality, 
uh, we need to, uh, it additionally predicts the texture warping that is applied to the high frequency texture. And the high frequency texture is predicted by the texture generator once per avatar. So it is shared for all the poses. And it, this texture basically acts as a residual to this low frequency component and tries to fix the mistakes that this part is not able to resolve. And this is the visualization of all the outputs of our method. So given the source image, we predict this uh, fixed high frequency texture. And then given a pose sequence, we predict these two components and fuse them together to obtain an uh, avatar with, uh, with quite a good quality. And after we did the, our evaluations and tried to reduce the competitive method, methods uh, in terms of their capacity and com computational complexity to run them on, on mobile devices, uh, we realized that given the same small computational budget, our system produces just better results than uh, the competitors. So these are the results that we were able to measure to run around like 42 milliseconds per frame on Samsung Galaxy S10 smartphone. Um, and while I guess they were good when they watched on the mobile screen, the quality is still lacking even compared to these full systems that would run in real time on desktops. Um, and additionally, the another problem that we had with this system is that it still relied on key points so cross reenactment, so reenacting this image with a um, driving track of a different person would actually imprint the identity and the results would be not so good uh, in, the, in the output. So to improve the quality of these avatars and to solve this cross reenactment issue, we um, decided to well, develop an ultimate like mega, a mega portrait system which would predict both avatars of high quality and also focus specifically on this cross reenactment scenario to basically be able to animate Mona Lisa. We built our work on two other uh, approaches. One was a latent pose descriptors, which provided a good alternative for the key point based driving. Uh, so the, in this work, instead of using key points, they used uh, pose descriptors that were trained unsupervised alongside the avatar. So they did not use key points, but used some latent representations for the pose and expression. And to do that, they had to juggle and balance between the capacity of the identity embedding a network and pose embedding network. And also use a lot of augmentations for the driver to prevent the system from overfitting. So we really liked this idea. It was developed by our colleagues in Samsung AI Center. Uh, but we wanted to get better image quality than that was available in this work. So we take, so there was another system that was developed concurrently that basically achieved the best results at the time in terms of image quality. It was face with to vid system. And the main idea here was to use latent volumetric representations to represent the avatar. So this avatar was no longer represented as some latent 2D feature map, but it was a three-dimensional feature map. And one benefit of going into three dimensions is that a complicated translation, uh, such as head rotation, uh, is now basically a linear transform of this latent feature grid. While for 2D maps, this transform is highly nonlinear. And so by simplifying the problem, since their avatar now, op uh, since their model is now operated in the 3D volumetric grids, they simplified the problem a lot and achieved, uh, arrived at very impressive quality of the results. So their uh, rendering process is visualized in this bottom row. So if we have the driver, we first have um, a canonical representation for our avatar in the frontal viewpoint and without any motion. And then we explicitly apply the head rotation from this driver and, and head translation to the feature, feature uh, volume, which encodes this avatar, and then impose the motion to produce the output. However, these two systems directly were not compatible because the latent descriptors were keep over, well, we, our combined system baseline approaches kept overfitting. So we could not introduce these latent descriptors into the space with the system that still used key points. Um, so 
in order to do that, we have to design uh, some more tricky approaches, which was done by my colleagues, Nikita, Zhenya, Taras, Losha, Victor, and Victor. And this is the results that we were able to achieve in the end. Um, to, our approach basically consisted of two parts. One part was directly borrowed from this bit to bit system, specifically the volumetric encoding. So we represented appearance of the source image as a, a volumetric um, tensor, latent tensor. And then the rendering and decoding was also borrowed from the bit to bit. But we had to design a new, a new approach to represent the motion and impose the motion onto this volumetric grid. And what we did, we used the same um, estimated head pose and latent expression vectors and then for source and the driver, and then combined them together to produce a 3D uh, volumetric motion grid, uh, warping grid that is applied to this latent volumetric appearance. And then it is rendered for, to obtain the prediction. So while in phase fit to bit system, they used key points to do that, we had to use the latent expressions and design a new method to facilitate them. And this method includes extensive usage of novel new augmentations, more severe augmentations for the driver that we had to incorporate into motion encoder. But more interestingly, uh, we, it, it, these augmentations were still not enough. And we had to introduce these contrastive learning objectives uh, that basically uh, supervised similar expression vectors to be close to each other while the similar to be far. For example, this driving image and this prediction by design of our inference pipeline described here should have the same motion vectors. And we can use that to supervise and make this vector disentangled from the volumetric appearance. And it was our, one of the, our key ideas. And it allowed us to achieve a better identity preservation when the cross reenactment is used. So in the face with Tovit system, uh, these results uh, were clearly like biased towards the shape and appearance of the driver, while our results preserved the appearance of the source and identity much better. And here are the results, additional examples. So we finally been able to, ever, to drive Mona Lisa and achieve um, good identity preservation between the image and the driver and, and, the, and the reenactment results. And here are some more results of our system. Um, take a look at the eye movement, because in key point based models, it's quite hard to model the eyes uh, because you have to well, use a key point detection network that actually detects the iris position and not so many approaches do that well. Well, in our approach, uh, since we used latent motion, we just encoded the I position into this latent vector and was able to reenact it in a quite lively manner. However, there was a major drawback with this system. Um, and the main problem was that if we look at the frontal view reenactments, which are similar to the source image, we can see that the identity is quite good. But if we take a look at the reenactments with the more extreme post changes, well, none of these images look similar to what the source, what the personal source image looks like. And the change in, the, uh, in this 90 degree turn is the most drastic. So unlike classical renders, these neural avatars, and it was a well-known issue, but we, I just wanted to highlight it at the example, using mega portraits as the example. So they lack view consistency unlike classical rendering methods in which your consistency, as I said before, is baked in because um, they use textured meshes. So we wanted to ground our neural avatars using some 3D representation and apply neural rendering on top of that 3D representation to achieve better view consistency. But when we looked at the uh, one-shot animatable facial reconstructions, the best thing that we were able to find was this DECA system that only tackled the face. So there were no systems that included rigging and were capable of animation that included hair and shoulders. So we had to design a system that does that and includes the reconstruction of these missing parts. For the rendering, however, of the meshes, there was already developed a really good method called deferred neural rendering 
in which instead of rendering a simple texture using the mesh, they render a latent texture, which consists of more channels and which is then refined using a neural network to produce the output image. So we decided in our approach to use deferred neural rendering as a rendering for the avatars, but to ground it in the 3D reconstructions. And we did not want to learn these reconstructions using scanning techniques or using uh, synthetic data. We tried to learn them from just in the wild data by looking at large collections of videos of people. And this work was done by Taras, Vanessa, Victor, and myself. Um, so overview of, the, of our method, basically, if we do look at the top row, it consists of, since our method operates in a single shot scenario, so it uses only one source image, we have to use this image to predict a neural texture via an encoder. And then we render this neural texture via deferred neural rendering using our reconstructed mesh for this, uh, for the, which is reenacted in the pose of the target frame. Uh, so the top row is basically one shot deferred neural rendering, while in the bottom row, uh, we perform this reconstruction. Um, given the target image and the source image, we first estimate the facial geometry and the head pose using the pre-trained extractor for which we use DECA, which I showed before. But then we, since the mesh reconstructed by DECA looks like this, it does not have any shoulders, it does not any, have any hair geometry, we try to incorporate it and reconstruct it um, by fusing neural texture with the texture, well, basically with coordinates of the vertices of this mesh into a single latent geometry map from which we can then sample the points which correspond to the vertices on the mesh and decode them into offsets using a shared um, MLP, uh, multi-layer perceptron. And uh, so in the predicted mesh, we do not change the topology because that would introduce too many degrees of freedom. So the uh, vertex connectivity remains the same, but all the vertices are, uh, are, well, are offset from the initial mesh in order to better reconstruct hair and shoulders geometry. And um, you can see that this, uh, well, all these results were learned by just looking at the images using photometric supervision without, well, only facial reconstruction uses um, 3D scans because we use a pre-trained parametric model that is trained on these scans, but hair and shoulders reconstruction are just learned from the data. And you can already see that even for the system, even though the renders are not as realistic as with mega portraits, they are more view consistent as you can see here. So at least in the frontal image, we kind of, it, it looks more like Brad Pitt than it is for mega portraits. Although it is still not perfect, it achieves better consistency with respect to the uh, novel viewpoint. And of course, like one could try to incorporate this, um, well, this can be extended because maybe meshes are not ideal to reconstruct here. Maybe uh, some sort of implicit functions, implicit density fields would work better. In that case, we just use meshes because it was simpler for us to do. Um, and it could also be incorporated and used with a stronger render to achieve a better view consistency. So to conclude, I'd like to say that in this thesis, multiple approaches were ex uh, explored, geometry-free approaches uh, in which we generate avatars by either direct prediction of the outputs using neural networks, using hybrid approaches, uh, that combine the warping based and the latent uh, fully convolutional um, avatars. And also we have proposed two methods that employ 3D representations, either it is explicit mesh based representation or implicit volumetric uh, appearance and volumetric motion representations. Um, and to conclude, I'd like to thank um, Samsung AI Center for providing all the resources without which this work would not be possible, Skoltek, and of course, my brilliant collaborators for making this work possible. I'd like to especially thank Dimo Ulyana for being a great mentor during my late master's and early PhD, uh, Sasha Shishay and Loshi Vachnyanka, who have been writing a couple papers together, and we worked with them for many years. Um, Taras Nikita, who were first authors of the um, publications where 
I took a more like a leadership position at Samsung and they really carried uh, these two latest publications by themselves and Vanessa Evgeny and of course Taras Igor who were also my co-authors and Viktor Lempitsky who without without Viktor I think I would not choose an academic career as a choice for me and others who I've worked with. I also thank my wife, Irina, my family, and especially my mother, Natalia, and my friends for their enormous support. And I think that this image below illustrates the progress that was uh, made uh, in this thesis. So in four years, we went from quite low quality avatars to this realistically looking animations of the paintings. And thank you for listening. Uh, that's it. Uh, Here's a list of publications, and I would be happy to answer your questions. Uh, thank you, Igor. Well, typically in the defense, you say thank you after everything is finished, but <laughs> anyway, it's, it's, it's not. I said thank you for listening. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah, so now I move to the next part of the procedure. So these are questions from the jury. So you can ask whatever questions uh, you want from the presentation of reading the text. However, for, for the procedure, procedural issues, I would like uh, also that um, every one of the every of the jury members says that if he's satisfied with the changes introduced to the thesis after the review. So we need to. I will ask this question in the end as well. So first, I would like to ask Do uh, Professor Jayagul Cho to ask his questions and share his thoughts on the presentation and thesis. Right, yeah, thank you very much for the presentation and uh, it was really interesting and uh, it was my great pleasure to be able to uh, be part of jury of your PhD thesis. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, in terms of the changes uh, uh, in the thesis, yeah, uh, I'm generally satisfied. And uh, uh, yeah, personally, I was actually, uh, yeah, I was actually familiar with uh, his research and the nice work, and uh, uh, which is practically well working and uh, quite insightful. And so, yeah, um, then I didn't have much feedback on his uh, initial draft of uh, thesis, uh, but then, uh, yeah, I was just asking, I believe, uh, uh, some uh, future research directions and uh, a little bit more insight about it. Uh, yeah, and then I am, again, generally satisfied uh, with uh, his revision of the thesis. And, uh, um, yeah, regarding the question that I'd like to ask during uh, this, uh, this session, um, yeah, I'm curious about, again, like, Kind of future research direction and uh, yeah uh, that can be that can benefit uh, other yeah other uh, researchers and especially I'm curious about your uh, yeah um, opinions about yeah recent uh, diffusion based uh, generative uh, approaches or models and uh, how uh, your approaches can compete against uh, against them and also uh, possibly how you can uh, uh, integrate or kind of combine uh, what you have done with the kind of uh, these kind of foundational kind of an approach uh, corresponding to this uh, uh, diffusion-based uh, generative models. Yep, that is my main question. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Cho, for the question. And I actually prepared a slide to answer this specific question. Um, so, like, how could the uh, well? I think that there is no um, contradiction between these two types of approaches. So while diffusion models right now, large scale diffusion models can create amazing results. For example, this image of a Pope wearing a puff jacket was created using just a textual prompt, which is impressive and it fooled everyone on the internet before people realized that it is fake. But if you want to use these models to create video content, for example, if you are a designer or if you are a um, you know, computer graphics artist, uh, then you really need to find a way to animate them. And I think that using head uh, and body motion and appearance priors help you in that. For example, in this viral video where Harry Potter characters were, were styled in uh, fashion brand Balenciaga style um, adaptation, 
uh, they used a neural head avatar to bring the images generated by diffusion models to life. And I think that um, while this uh, similar results can probably be generated by video-based diffusion models, they would require just exponentially more data and compute to do that because of just all the varieties of motion. And I feel that um, it's open question, of course, but it feels to me that specialized models that just focus on human appearance will do better job of animating this still image than a generative diffusion model could do given the same amount of data. And regarding future directions, I feel like, well, we are already using the diffusion models to create head avatars. So the topic of my thesis was uh, generative adversarial networks. And in some way, like um, the, their era, I would say, may be coming to a close because more and more approaches start to use a different type of generative model, a diffusion model to like as a generative prior for their methods. But however, I still feel like uh, some of the general ideas uh, that we used in our approaches, such as um, grounding the synthesis in 3D reconstruction, so like uh, achieving a proper 3D understanding of the world is what is missing right now in these diffusion models that are basically only using like all this large number of parameters, similarly to how these uh, data-driven avatars were created, which I talked about in the beginning. And it feels to me that introduction of 3D priors, human appearance priors, human 3D scans would actually be, can be used in conjunction with these diffusion approaches to get better results. And I already have some follow-up work uh, which was done by Vanessa, um, who I worked with previously, uh, with, where we fuse diffusion models um, into human appearance modeling. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much for the answer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That. Uh, yeah. I'm. Yeah. Quite. Uh, yeah. Satisfied uh, with your, with your comments and uh, opinions. Yep. Thanks. Thank and that's it from my side. Okay. Thank you, Professor mm -hmm. Cho. So next, I would like mm -hmm. to ask uh, Professor uh, Tatian Tat Cham to give his feedback, questions, comments for, about the thesis and the presentation. Uh, we don't hear you. Uh, because I, I, I think you are... Okay, let's just, no rush. Okay. Okay, we still don't hear you. Oh, okay. No. So, dear Chairman, Professor Asilidis, maybe we shall move to, uh, to another jury member and I will try okay, to let's contact move to another to Professor Chairman. Okay, okay. Let's, let's, so, sorry, yes, yeah, so we have some technical difficulties. Let's move to another and do jury member and then get back to you. To, 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 to the professor. So uh, then, then I would like to ask Professor uh, Howley to give his feedback. Let's hope that the connection will work. You can. You guys can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. So first of all, really good presentation. I really enjoyed uh, the defense. I think it was uh, really well organized and a lot of really good work collected from the thesis. Uh, I reviewed the thesis um, and um, I provided some feedback in the initial draft. Um, they were already in a satisfactory um, state back then, uh, but I think
how this new draft is even better. Um, so yeah, th thanks for incorporating the stuff. So it's I, I'm happy with how the thesis look, looks like. I think it's a very good thesis. Um, let me come to the question. So let me ask one question first, and that is basically um, the outcome of your thesis, right? So you have basically explored um, several methods uh, based on uh, 2D representations and then also based on 3D representations. And I like the fact that you started to explore, you know, the basic representations and see how you can push uh, the limits of it and then start to realize that there are some limitations where if you just do 2D, but then incorporate 3D. Um, however, if you look at uh, a lot of the work out there, um, depending on the scenarios, uh, people still have preferences uh, from one representation to another. We, um, if now you were to develop a product, uh, what would be um, what would be your recommendation if you were to build a avatar reading system? Let's start with the face and then let's describe uh, for the body. What is your summary of when to use what? When do you use a 2D representation? When do you use a 3D representation? And, when, and what are the limitations of both? And what would be the ideal representation for you? Yeah, thank you, Ali, for the question. Um, that's a really interesting question because probably it's a million dollars idea if it's executed correctly. Um, so there are quite a lot of startups. So you are a CEO of a company that does exactly that. And uh, there are a couple of other companies that do that. So if you're, if you're talking about the facial representation, it feels to me that the methods that have been developed like uh, a few years ago, which I started with, were already work quite well because facial geometry, except for the mouth cavity, is quite flat and it's quite well approximated with these parametric models. The problem begins when we're trying to model the entire head, which includes the hair, which is notoriously difficult to 3D scan and model when we uh, model the clothing, when we model the full body, uh, here you really need to introduce some priors. And I think that um, in the future, we would actually not just, we would have to not only use the 3D uh, reconstructions to guide the rendering, but I also think that we have to incorporate simulated 3D reconstructions. So physically simulated 3D reconstructions. Because in order to learn the behavior of, for example, loose clothing, um, it would be it would require enormous amount of data without just writing some equations for the energy of this mesh, which represents the clothing, and then trying to minimize it explicitly and using this as a guiding signal. So it all depends on the complexity of the underlying geometry that we're tackling. So for relatively simple geometry, for example, facial swap. I really think that it's all about it's feasible to gather enough data to just make a model that would work perfectly well and is production grade. But if we're talking about a realistic um, a loose hair synthesis or full body, closed full body synthesis, we really need to incorporate this 3D component. Um, and yeah, I mean, uh, if I was so if I was doing a product. I, I would also try to limit probably the um, uh, way this avatar is being applied, right? Because when we talked about mega portraits, I said that for frontal views, it works great. For side views, not so great. Of course, if you are doing a product, you can limit the way that your system is applied and make it so that this frontal view reenactment scenario is viable in your case. Like, for example, if you want to uh, make... Uh, Talking portraits in the gallery, we don't need this uh, ex synthesi to synthesize extreme viewpoints. However, if we're trying to make a teleconference system, we have to do that. So really, so each technology has its own potential applications. And I think that everything that, more or less everything that was described in this thesis um, can be like adapted and after a few years made into a good product. 
It's just that if we're talking, looking at peak goals, uh, like teleconferencing, for example, that there we really need to make all those advancements that we've been working on for these years and uh, other people in the community have been working on and continue to work on. Um, so I guess that's, that's my answer. Yes. So um, another question would be, um, so it seems like depending on what kind of limitations, um, the current approach right now is to come up with ad hoc um, constraint or prior or uh, architecture for a specific problem, but then it might reintroduce another problem or might introduce another limitation. Do you actually think that the way, um, it, can this problem be solved more generally? And would the answer be just having better and more data? Is the data, the, do you think the data is the majority? What is your, how much percentage through your gut feeling, you don't have to quantify exactly, you think is a data problem? Because maybe using a suboptimal representation, you can actually just solve it using just more and better data. Well, that's spot on because if we look at, for example, diffusion models, so a lot of people like Jan Likan and others are arguing that autoregressive uh, generative modeling um, is not a way to go. It has a lot of issues. However, if you just throw enough data at it, it just magically works. So I think that, and the same can be said for most of our projects. So in this case, um, one of the major factors, and I would say it, it, it is really like the defining factor of why this um, side view reenactment does not work is just the lack of data in the data set. So we're trying to solve this problem uh, because we're trying to play around the existing data sets because gathering data sets with humans is expensive. It has a lot of legal issues. So you really have to account for that when, when you're doing um, when you're doing video synthesis. And of course, the data plays an important part, but whether or not it can be everything, can everything be solved using data? I'm just not sure. And uh, uh, in my opinion, I still think that uh, going 3D, um, incorporating physical constraints, for example, you're trying to animate this uh, Pope image in this puff jacket. So how do you learn the physics of this puff jacket? So how much data do you need to learn the physics of every possible object? While you can just write down the equations and the equations will tell you what's for this pose, the equilibrium state for this dead jacket. Because like, um, I, I still think that uh, while suboptimal representations given enough data can truly perform miracles, um, I still think that incorporating physics-based constraint and 3D constraints is important because, well, the model that has such priors, given the same amount of data, would work better than a generic model without such priors, at least in my opinion. Thank you. I'm done with my questions. And maybe let me just test. Okay. Oh, okay. Super. Well, yeah. Then. I suggest that Professor Cham ask his question. All right, thank you very much. Sorry for the uh, little uh, technical hiccup. I'm not exactly sure what happened, but you can hear me now, right? Absolutely. Okay, yes. that's great. <laughs> All right, um, thanks Igor for a really nice presentation and also for really contributing to the research over the last couple of years. I think, uh, I think we've made a tremendous uh, progress. And, you know, as I wrote in my report, uh, the, the number of works that you squeezed into a thesis, that's quite unusual uh, compared to, you know, other theses that I've, I've uh, looked at. So that's, uh, it's, I don't know how thick you, you, you have uh, if you have to print it out, but it's probably quite, quite substantial. All right, so uh, I have a couple of questions and I think I will uh, sort of veer to, towards a bit more philosophical since it's a PhD. Uh, so like, so, so one, for the first question, maybe I will have to begin is um, when you have, a, uh, a person trying to drive someone else's face. I want to explore the concept of identity. What makes a person a person? Is it just appearance? Is it uh, the person's uh, quotes? So kind of uh, motion style versus content. People have 
try to talk about you know uh, the difference between the two. What is your take on it to really affect uh, identity preservation of the source, but uh, motion content transfer of the uh, of the type of the driving uh, video? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the question. That's a really good one. And I recently discussed this uh, problem with my friend. And, uh, um, well, I can't say that I can, specific, like, working with faces for four years, I don't think that I can still, like, say what makes the face realistic. Uh, because if you look at Hollywood, so why do they spend so much money on trying to perfect this uh, computer graphics um, human uh, s synthesis? Because if people look at, uh, people are really good at dissecting whether or not the image of a person, a generated image of a person is fake or not. And this is due to our psychology and the so-called like Kenny Valley effect, where the more realistic the image becomes, at some point, uh, we start to dislike it quite heavily. And only after it surpasses some high degree of realism, only then we can basically perceive it as another human being. So like surpassing this uncanny valley can be quite challenging. And it's not clear uh, what, what contributes. The lighting certainly contributes the realisticness of facial expression. So here you can see that deepfakes were used to animate this. But uh, even here, there are some problems with the eyes, at least which I can perceive. They are somehow misaligned and so on. So like all these minor things, they can actually impact our, the, the, the way that whether we, or not we like this generated image as a human being or not. And it's really hard to tell which contributes to what. But the generative models somehow are capable of capturing like it's probably due to the fact that they can uh, pr produce realistic images, uh, probably due to the fact that, I don't know, the collection of images are large enough to be able to synthesize them. But Sorry, I mean, can I just quickly looking... interrupt? So actually my question is yeah? about identity preservation rather than realism. So what okay. makes a person that person? I think it's a bit different from realism, right? Because you can have uh, caricatures that kind of obviously yeah. is meant to represent somebody. Uh, okay. And it's very, very faked. Uh, so, so what makes a person's identity uh, identity? Right now, I got the question. Um, so, regarding identity, I think it's more or less the same as realism. It's just it really depends on the person that is looking. Also, because if you are familiar with the person, for example, when we were generating this. Um, avatars while well, these talk, talking heads. Um, here is the example. So if you are not familiar with these people and you look at, for example, this image and the source image, you can say, uh -huh, they're probably similar. But if you're looking at your own avatar, you 100% will spot that it is not similar at all. And the same can be said about like this modern system, mega portraits. So probably if a person on this image would look at these images, they would say, ah, they're, they're completely off. But when we're looking at, I don't know, Brad Pitt reenactment, uh, since we're not like closely familiar with them, since we only saw them on a big screen, or we're just looking at this reference image and comparing it with the reference image, uh, we're perceiving it as basically the same person. Um, however, the major impact, uh, the, the major thing that plays a part in recognizing a person is whether or not the video is dynamic or static. Because for static frames, even in our neural talking heads work, uh, we achieved indistinguishable results. So in neural talking heads, if we take the data set that we used to train for 32 training frames, the, the users could not distinguish uh, the fake image from the real ones. But we did not like uh, test the way that whether or not you could recognize them because and also the population played a part in this user study because we used a uh, Russian service and the Russian since this data set consisted of um, English celebrities, um, the Russian people were not familiar with uh, uh, most of them. <laughs> so if they were familiar, they would probably these results would probably be much worse. So 
familiarity is a rather tricky question, and I don't think that any like one shot system really nails it um, to say that a person whose avatar is created would not be able to distinguish it from the reality. I think that technology is just not there yet. Thanks. I, I think that's that a great answer because uh, so it's like you know identity being uh, sort of on a spectrum and not an identity that is uh, universal to just that person, but in fact to the perceiver, the person who's looking. Uh, the kind of a uh, uh, level of precision that's needed is actually very different. Uh, that's a good point. Thank, thanks. So maybe you just want one other question. Since uh, you also kind of earlier mentioned about GANs perhaps running its course and coming you know, to the end of sort of an era, what do you think in your current works or in your thesis, what would sort of stand the test of time? And again, I think the time horizon these days uh, is much shorter. People talk about 10 years. I don't think in this era... Ten years is <laughs> survivable, but what do you think will survive past uh, the next couple of years? It's very hard to say. Uh, I probably cannot talk about our latest models, um, although a lot of a lot of approaches actually utilize the same scheme. But if we talk about the models that uh, we the approaches that we developed previously, I would say that. Um, when we developed this thing, uh, we pitched it as a meta learner. So we really, we, at the time, we realized that uh, using a small set of images as basically training data for the meta learner to learn how to generate such avatar uh, was a quite good perspective. And I think in some way it stood the test of time because right now there are papers written that improve upon the specific meta learning perspective that we presented in this work. Um, another thing that I um, think that is quite useful and I'm proud of is this um, texture assignments, texture coordinates um, idea. So we were not the first to try it and it was used in multiple like follow-up and concurrent works. But I think that this idea of using warpings uh, in uh, to represent the motion, it leads to um, just so like after this work, after this neural talking heads work, uh, we used one form or another form of this texture coordinates or predicted warpings in all of our works. Even our mega portraits used the volumetric warping. And I think that this like uh, this, the fact that this warping is so um, low frequency, it's quite coarse, uh, leads to some uh, interesting like byproduct artifacts, such as the fact that these images are quite view consistent. So you see some flicker, and this flicker happens especially in the hair region. But in the facial region, there is very little flicker in terms of the texture. And all that's due to the... And meanwhile, we're not using any like guidance for the video. We're only using frame by frame training. So how could the lack of flicker appear? And I think that it's all due to the fact that we, uh, in most of our works, we used coordinates warpings. But I can say that it's our idea. It's kind of like was developed simultaneously in multiple labs in the community. So I think that these are two main ideas that I'm proud that we have developed. But of course, like specific training techniques probably will not stand the test of time in the horizon that you're talking about. Yeah. Thank you. That's that's all my questions. And again, I'm very satisfied with the thesis as the current state and also the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, so and when I was listening to the talks and watch the videos, if you look at our like Zoom-like videos, we actually have talking heads right now. And I actually thought that there is not a big difference between the presentations that we have, uh, the, the actual view and the generated ones that we see in the presentation. Anyway, so next I'd like to ask uh, Professor Gonzalo uh, Ferrer to give his feedback. Okay. Um, thank you, Igor, for the presentation. I think it was um, actually very engaging. So. Um, lots of videos, uh, supporting material. Um, I think you also have to read the thesis before, let's say, um, <laughs> um, 
listening to this presentation, but still this is fine. Um, so we all did before in advance. Um, so um, I I'm interested in this transition um, from, let's say, just the 2D model to the 3D model, and then how you are insisting in, in the importance of the um, 3D model that you have uh, there for some applications. I mean, this was um, already discussed, so I kind of understand now that it's not that um, the direction is there, but still there's some choice depending on the task. So I think uh, this, this was like very, um, well, very good clarification on, 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 on where exactly, what exactly we are talking about because um, application matters a lot. But my question is about this, right? So. Um, you can, let's say, do more involved um, task once you have the 3D model, but this is very tricky. So you g g got from volume, then mesh. Um, how tricky is just to set like uh, these this, um, models, let's say, with more capabilities? How hard it is just to use this from, um, um, from single image as you are doing, and, and then at the end, um, what is the complexity? I mean, is it worth the, the extra complexity you are adding here to the system? Or um, what is your thought? Because I think this is a little bit trade off, right? That I would be interested in knowing. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I think that, well, our method has already, I think, that there have been some works uh, that use implicit functions, for example, for the reconstruction. And it feels to me that. Uh, such an approach to 3D modeling, which employs some sort of 3D representation and neural-based rendering on top of that, um, is uh, more natural and fruitful because even though it adds a little bit of complexity in the way we represent the avatar. So, of course, uh, this system uh, is a lot more complex, this generation system, than this system that consists of just two neural networks and uh, probably the uh, large-scale transformer, uh, well, large-scale transformers that I use to guide diffusion models are even more simpler because they consist of just like uh, simple, simple layers uh, of attention and uh, multi-layer perceptrons. So like, I still think that um, it is worth designing these uh, complex systems uh, because only accessing the exact 3D representation uh, we can obtain, uh, if you're talking about head avatars, we can obtain some sort of invariances. For example, we can formulate this complex body motion, which like all the arm motions, all the uh, leg motions, using simple combination of linear transformations. While in 2D projection, if we're not going into 3D, uh, like even the head rotation is a complex non-linear transformation of the uh, uh, of the 2D image, while in 3D it's just a simple linear transformation. And I feel like to incorporate this sort of um, so like it just I think it's more natural to just look at the um, so the world around us is mostly like three-dimensional and like using two-dimensional representation is just making it harder for, for the network. It will generalize poorly, it will require more data, it would require more training. And I think that designing these more complex uh, methods is totally worth it uh, because in the end, we just uh, probably will get uh, better results in terms of, uh, maybe not in terms of quality in specific applications, but we would be able to generalize to uh, different applications, different rendering scenarios, and so on. Um, but the complexity, I think that, uh, well, it, th there are good, good tricks how to make it work, and we didn't tackle a lot of uh, full body in this thesis, but for, for full body people, they actually already like implemented a lot of uh, tricks that can do 3D reconstruction given a single image. So in this CVPR, there are a number of works that do that. And I think that it will not be too long until some few shot or one shot systems start appearing for full body as well. And they will certainly use uh, 3D uh, based uh, rendering. For the heads, you can cheat, but for the full body, it's much harder to cheat mm -hmm. and just learn a system that predicts everything, learns everything from the data. Um, 
I hope I answered. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, very good. So. Um, Yes, and then well, the question is also like um, um, you also commented on on these um, physics simulators, on this geometry for full bodies. I think yes, that can be <laughs> very interesting. But I guess yes, um, uh, important to see. Um, okay, so um, yeah, I think I think this this is all 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 my questions. Um, the updates you did on the thesis um, look quite good. Again, I want to congratulate you because um, uh, for me the, the presentation today was like very engaging. Uh, I have enjoyed, although I'm not really like um, a person in the field, but I see like um, these um, kind of spectacular applications that you are putting here into... I also understand that there was a lot of work just to make it look so um, let's say, yes, so spectacular, but um, still, um, um, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Gonzalo. So, yeah, we are almost done. Two, two more to go. Dmitry Dilov, please. Um, hello, Igor. Thank you for the presentation. Excellent work. As you know, I'm a big fan. So, and also I'm a little bit out of questions towards the end because a lot of my questions were already asked. Whoever had the chance to ask first asked about the diffusion model, obviously. And I, I actually, uh, yeah, one question that I still have. Oh, okay, let's go with formal first. Formally, I see all of the corrections. I see the changes from the report, so I have no... Uh, uh, complaints, everything is closed as far as the formal side is uh, uh, concerned. So, but with the diffusion model um, still, sorry for going back, <laughs> you probably were ready for that. It's not just about the architecture itself, it's about this sampling strategies and clever ways of how to sample it from noise, right? And it was already shown that diffusion processes could be integrated into guns, so it's not just guns on their own. So maybe you could speculate about those steps that maybe diffusion process, is it worth of complicating your architecture even further? What would it give, give to you? Uh, and um, well, I would say that I'm 100% pro using uh, diffusion models in human image synthesis because I believe that they are just much better generative models compared to GANs. In our experiments, they do not overfit as much as GANs. We can train them from a relatively small amount of data, at least in the work that we did in Samsung right now. Um, I also think that uh, this process uh, of like gradually denoising the image, well, I, I cannot say like it, how different it is from GANs. It just seems to be the fact that it's simpler to train a network that uh, should be simpler to train the network that like, produces small changes to the output rather than generating the whole image from scratch. But I mean, that's just some like speculation and hand waving. I just think that in practice, since diffusion models work, uh, achieve much better results, it's totally worth to incorporate them into the avatars. And I can say that we're already doing exactly that. Um, and we found them to be quite useful. Thank you. Uh and let's close it on a classical then. Um, so on the slide 41, you have that architecture with the, uh, with, hmm? yes, this over one? here, you split the high frequency and low frequency. So my first question is how, what, what was the realization that made you consider the split in the first place? And then if you were considering any classical losses, something that preserves high frequency, for example, like a winner filter, something basic mm -hmm. from the classical old era. So, yeah, thank you for the question. I feel like this split between high and low frequencies, so we call them high and low frequencies to just better explain what's going on. Otherwise, it is purely data-driven. So this low frequency component is actually what the inference generator, the lightweight inference generator, is man managed to learn as approximation of the output image. So it could contain all the high frequencies that we need and the quality would be great, 
and we would be happy with it. But in reality, it did not because the capacity of this network is quite low. So we had to come up with some residual to this component. And this residual we call high frequency component, although it does not really only contains high frequencies. And you can see that it even contains some color where low frequency component is incorrect. So it actually contains a lot of things. We cannot call it really some like uh, the fact that it only contains only the edges, uh, only the wrinkles. You can see that the eyes are clearly visible and some and eyes are actually white. So the network learned that it does not have to predict the this white um, um, eyeballs uh, in the low frequency component when it can learn them in the high frequency component because most people have their eyeballs white and it does not really like matter for it to put it here. So uh, it kind of is related to the filtering, but not quite because it's just trained in an unsupervised fashion. So the separation is not supervised by any means. I was, um, I was implying that yeah. maybe you could learn which frequencies are better because you took low frequencies, but maybe it shouldn't be just a cutoff uh, frequency. Maybe some high frequency, I needed some low frequencies for particular objects. That's what would be cool. Yeah, but we didn't learn a cutoff. Um, so this uh, predicted uh, uh, additive component was learned to match the output. And it could learn, so there is no cutoff frequency or like decomposition in the frequency domain. Um, we just, it's just the best approximation for the output that the inference generator could learn. Um, so we, it, it could theoretically introduce higher frequencies uh, into, the, uh, into this component. But since uh, convolutional neural networks are biased towards um, lower frequency components, it was easier for it to predict just that and use this as a residual. But of course, well, since this training is a bit competitive, um, maybe this high frequency component also at some point starts preventing uh, this component from learning higher frequencies. So mm -hmm. thank you. I don't think that that's the case. This is a good answer. Thank you. Thank you, Igor. Thank okay. you for the question. Thank you, Dmitry. So, yeah, so I'm the only one left, so I'm also satisfied with the revision. Uh, so, well, I would just uh, ask uh, several sort of not... Uh, maybe the uh, first question, maybe that is not related to the actual content of the talk. Yeah, so you have many co-authors. Uh, and while well, in most of the papers you are the first author, but still, uh, can you highlight your personal contributions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so here's the list of publications. So in the first paper with image manipulation as perceptual discriminators, uh, me and Diana, we shared a uh, joint first co-authorship. And uh, I was responsible for uh, doing these experiments at so, like, you notice that we have the two groups of experiments at lower resolution and at high resolution, and I was responsible to making the system basically work at high resolution by introducing additional losses, additional constraints. I just didn't explain them uh, in the presentation for the sake of time. Um, in the next work uh, in textured neural avatars, this was done by a large collaboration, and the first author was Sasha Shashaya. So I was responsible for, like, helping to prepare the manuscript, uh, generating figures, generating experiments, but also I was uh, really focused on making the uh, facial appearance uh, work better in the system compared to the like base approaches. Because at the time, a lot of systems, uh, they uh, tried to treat uh, facial reenactment and full body reenactment differently. And we tried to do the same uh, for, for this model. In the end, we like ended up not including it in the publication because the results were not ready. But after like the deadline, as it always happens, we got some results. We actually improved the both the facial and hands quality. But basically, that's what I was responsible for in this project, introducing GANs into the mix and trying to improve the quality of facial and hands um, 
the quality of the reenactment. So in the next publication, I was the first author and I was responsible for like development of the methods. Um, so uh, came up basically with this idea of uh, using a style transfer to um, stylize the key points and that if we use a large scale data set of videos, well, we can try this system. And so like this architecture, I can say that, well, I came up with, with the help of my, with the advice of my colleagues um, as a first author on this paper and did like most of the experiments, but Igor and Sasha also, also helped me to prepare it, to prepare their submission. And the fast belayer neural synthesis. Uh, so I also was the first author, um, was responsible for the design of this architecture. So the belayer idea, it was actually either Sasha's or Victor's, the idea of decomposing this into layers, but the, like the architecture and the training procedure of how to train it, um, um, I came up on my own and also I did not talk about it, but there was also an important component about learnable fine tuning of the texture, which I, uh, also like pr proposed and, um, designed and uh, both the architecture and the training method. Um, so for the next two papers, I uh, shifted towards the role of the supervisor and I was the first, uh, I was the last author in both of these publications. So in Mega Portraits, Nikita Drobyshev was the main author and of course, like he did uh, the main job in actually developing this method. He came up with this contrastive losses idea. So like I came up with this augmentations idea. So we kind of shared, so like I written some of the code base for this as well as for the next project. But here I mostly shifted towards the role of supervisor and just trying to generate ideas and solve problems. And the same happened with the, the last mesh-based head avatars um, where Taras was the lead author and uh, basically he did most of the experiments with this. I also wrote a bunch of code, did a bunch of experiments, but of course, uh, he was the main contributor in that. And yeah, so I hope that um, I was thorough enough. Um, yeah, yeah, it was my... very specific and it was very convincing. Yeah, I also have um, a technical question about the identity preservation. Is there any way to measure it, like in a loss function that you have? Because you said, okay, we see the key points on the face uh, and so on, it's imprinted. Is this a co quantitative or qualitative measure? Yeah, um, it is both uh, qualitative and quantitative. So in the first uh, works, we did not have uh, like any good idea how to measure it, but later we used user study to measure mm -hmm. it, but mostly we used it to measure realism. Uh, but in the follow-up works, we actually used specific metrics to do that. Um, so for the post-preservation, uh, we measured the normalized error between the key points. So it's not really a good metric if we are talking about systems that do not use key points. But since in this particular model in the chapter four, we used key points, it was made sense to measure the difference in um, the key points measured on the reenacted face and compare them with the ones that we uh, feed as an input. Uh, for the identity preservation, we use uh, facial recognition uh, networks. Uh, so like we could predict, use this image and this image, uh, run it through the facial recognition system, obtain an embedding that is used for retrieval, for facial recognition and so on, and just compare these two embeddings. And this gives us a, quality, a quantitative measure for identity preservation. Uh, so. They're both, they're both qualitative and quantitative. And we measured this identity preservation in all of our subsequent works. I just skipped the slides with the metrics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, I, very clear. So I don't have uh, any more questions. So I actually missed if Victor is here because I did not have a look or uh -huh. he, is he here? Yes, I'm sure. Ah, you're here. Okay, okay, then. Now, please say something. Ivan, Professor Silenitz, I'm sorry, but we also have some questions from audience. Ah, okay. We... Yeah, so, sorry, Victor. Say we have that. questions from the audience. We should, do we have them or? Yes, we do. Ah, okay. 
maybe if Nade if Nadezhda can could help uh, to, to show them on the okay, screen. Okay, there is uh, Violeta Habibulina. Yes, so it's a great p pleasure to have her here. Uh, when anyway. Uh, oh. Could you please uh, voice the questions so that uh, I can uh, open just, the slides? Just and... a second. So uh, as, a, as, a, as a chair, uh, let me actually uh, co-investigate. So I think the question about co-investigate individual impact has been answered. The financial sources is not the topic. Russian Academia in all companies, sorry, we don't have time for that. Uh, show the last slides with full names. This would be shared. I think... Yeah, so uh, don't think we have any other questions. So, yeah, still. Uh, yeah, Igor, yeah, you don't I, have to answer uh, it yeah, anyway. So, Victor, please. Yeah, uh, I hope it will be uh, quieter this time. So, yes, uh, so Igor has been my uh, PhD student for the last... Uh, Five years, I think, since 2018. Before that, he had been my master student for another two years, and uh, I can actually only talk about him in superlative forms. He's like uh, exceptionally strong, exceptionally passionate about research, and um, um, it was like a great pleasure to, to work with him. I hope he learned something from me, but um, uh, I also learned a lot from him, uh, got a lot of insights about thinking, how to think about uh, generative networks, how they perform relatively to each other. Uh, so um, there was also, you know, initially I was sort of playing the supervisor role, but uh, I can vouch that Igor described his role in the project very accurately, if a bit modestly. Uh, and indeed, for the last uh, two or three years, you know, in our project in some guy center, he took the supervisor role, and I was just consulting those projects. And uh, indeed, he did very well in this capacity as well. I'm very sure he has a very bright future in academia or industry. Uh, and I'm very curious to see uh, what he comes up with. Uh, Next. Uh, okay, thank, thank you, you Victor. Victor. Yeah, so now we have the deliberation. The colleagues, uh, I think our jury is ready with the decision. So, Professor Seledis. Yeah, so with after a very long discussion, which took several minutes, we decided, Igor, that your thesis is accepted as it is, with comments like excellent, outstanding, uh, very ex extremely good. So I congratulated with the getting your PhD degree. So have good luck. Congratulations. Thanks. Yeah, Thanks and since you already said all the things in the beginning, you can say something else as well, if you want. Well, um, I think that I just want to reiterate and thank a lot Skoltech for awarding me this PhD degree and giving me the opportunity to work with uh, brilliant colleagues, but also Samsung KI Center. So I cannot overstate how much computational resources were allocated for this project. And well, uh, probably it's just uh, I owe a lot in this thesis to just raw computational resources provided by Skaltech and of course, uh, I mean, Samsung and of course, brilliant colleagues, uh, which I already thanked before. Um, yeah, so just, I'm just happy to finally receive my PhD. Thank you. Thanks. And we're happy to have you as well, for sure. Uh, thanks. Yeah, so the defense has ended. Have a good Whatever you are doing, actually, I don't know <laughs> where you are, what time of the day, but I'm sure that it will be a great day. Thanks. Okay, thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.